In this session, we'll be looking at some additional forms of uh, what broadly could be called Christianity um, that developed in the United States, uh, many of them in the 19th century, the early part of the 19th century. I say broadly uh, because with these groups, many of them, um, though not all of them, some of them we would consider more traditional denominations of Christianity, some of them would be more uh, groups that just had some close connections with Christianity. And there are certainly some that may not even consider themselves Christians or use uh, that term uh, Christian. Uh, so as I've mentioned before, we're, we're trying to look at this from a very broad umbrella of, of Christianity. So uh, that's part of the reason why I've included them here. Um, out of these new Christianities that developed in the antebellum period, of course, Mormonism is probably the most successful. Um, and then after that, we'll be talking about the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, here in a little bit. Uh, those are probably the two uh, biggest groups, uh, Seventh-day Adventists uh, after that, and then a couple other groups we're going to talk about here um, predominantly uh, have, have died off or have mostly died off. Uh, or cease to exist. So um, we'll we'll take a look at these. One of the first ones, and you know, part of the reason for bringing them up is to think about how people adapted to the new situation of the early republic, antebellum period, uh, created new forms of Christianity, felt they had the ability and the right to do that, and really began to um, create you know, these American forms of Christianity uh, that didn't have the same kind of background in Europe as uh, some of the more traditional ones. So I think that that's an important thing for us to recognize, uh, you know, that the uh, there is this way in which the, the new American situation provided people uh, the opportunity and the justification uh, for this. And as I mentioned, some of them uh, are not traditional forms of Christianity in uh, the least. And much like Mormonism developed out of these charismatic leaders who may or may not have had some sort of uh, supernatural um, you know, a justification like a vision or an appearance or a manifestation or something like that. Uh, so, you know, there's a, there's a lot of ways these charismatic leaders are very, very important for the, these new Christianities. Uh, one of the first uh, I want us to think about uh, briefly is a group known as the, the Shakers. Uh, the Shakers, uh, their official name uh, was the United Society of Believers in Christ's Second Appearing. So the emphasis on this idea of, of Christ's uh, Second Appearing, and we'll talk about that uh, here uh, as we think about uh, the woman that started the Shakers, uh, a woman named Ann Lee, later known as uh, Mother Ann Lee. Uh, she was uh, born in England and uh, came to the United States uh, in 1774 with uh, eight followers. She had come to believe, uh, because of visions and trances, uh, that she was uh, kind of the, the female incarnation of the second coming of Christ. That Christ had come um, first uh, as a male, uh, but was now, uh, she was the second coming of Christ as a female incarnation, believing that God was both male and female. One of the major uh, things that, that Shakers uh, were most known for was their lack of uh, sexual activity. Um, believing that the uh, root of all sin was sexual activity uh, and, and that sex essentially uh, you know most religious groups turn to uh, families uh, or expect families to help propagate the religious group right that, that part of the ways religious groups continue is by individuals in the group having children. But because um, Lee and the Shakers were convinced that uh, the end of all things, right, uh, you know, Christ's return as far as, uh, you know, the his, uh, 
uh, his coming in judgment, uh, the end of the world, uh, because there was a belief uh, of that and because uh, Ann Lee was there and, was, and there was going to be a transformation of society, um, you know, that, that there wasn't the need for that propagation of, um, of, the, uh, uh, of the group through um, procreation. That wasn't the only uh, thing that was forbidden. Uh, the Shakers also lived a very strict uh, communal life. Uh, you know, they held property in common. Uh, they uh, lived in separate quarters. Um, and, you know, the expectation was when you became a Shaker, you joined a Shaker community. Um, it, it wasn't like uh, you, um, you know, kind of stayed a Shaker where you were. You joined one of these communities. Uh, living in separate quarters, men and women. Uh, marriages were essentially dissolved. Uh, children were no longer really the uh, connected with their biological parents, were, but, but were a part of the entire community, uh, providing a lot of the labor uh, that was done. Um, and there were a variety of other moral uh, restrictions uh, that they were expected to follow as well. Um, the group started in upstate New York, or, you know, Ann Lee, when she came to the United States, started in upstate uh, New York, that burned over district that we mentioned in a previous lesson. Uh, New England also had some. Uh, they moved to uh, into Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky. Uh, there were about 6,000 Shakers by the middle of the 19th century. Now, you know, essentially, uh, we might begin to think, okay, well, eventually, Lee died. Um, if people are joining the Shakers and they're not having sex, so they're not having children, how does this group continue? Uh, well, you know, certainly there were some children in the community. Uh, there would have been people that had children uh, when they converted. Uh, and so that's part of how people were uh, brought into the community. Um, you know, there were other cases where parents who might not have had the, uh, uh, you know, parents in, in nearby communities who might not have had the ability uh, to care for their children gave them to the Shakers or, you know, kind of abandoned them with the Shakers. So that sometimes happened. Um, sometimes Shakers found children, you know, children just kind of left um, wandering or abandoned, uh, sometimes adopted children. Uh, that was the, the case as well. Uh, and then sometimes there were children that, that converted to the Shakers through the se during the Second Great Awakening. Uh, there were a lot of children uh, that converted to a variety of Christian groups during the Second Great Awakenings and the revivals. Uh, you know, frequently uh, the Shakers would recruit converts during camp meetings. Uh, that uh, you know they they were there to uh, try and, and recruit uh, others as well. Um, but largely, you know, Shaker parents were pretty well excluded from uh, their uh, their children's their biological children's lives. Now you might be wondering. Okay, if, if the group's called the United so Society of Believers in Christ's Second Appearing, where did the name Shakers come from? Why is it called Shakers? Well, the, uh, the, shaker, the term Shaker uh, became a, uh, attached to the group because of a dance that they participated in. Uh, pictured here uh, from a, a 19th century uh, artwork. Uh, they were uh, referred to as shaking Quakers at first, you know, thinking that people were connected with the Quaker group or the Friends uh, movement. Um, so shaking Quakers because of the ways they danced, sh kind of shaking off sin, uh, and that eventually got, uh, you know, kind of uh, into uh, the uh, the Shakers. Right? The, the eventually it morphed uh, into the Shakers. Uh, a rather interesting uh, period uh, during the history of the Shakers uh, came during the 1830s and 1840s, uh, around the same time as Mormonism uh, is beginning to develop. 
um, known as the era, uh, era of manifestation, uh, sometimes referred to as mother's work uh, for Mother Ann Lee. Essentially, it was uh, due to uh, the preoccupation of some people at this time, some shakers at this time, with the spiritual world. Um, believing in spirit possession, you know, there was a lot of interest uh, in um, the spiritual world at this time. Of course, we talked about with Mormonism, uh, the belief in angels, angels appearing to people, revelation. Uh, there's a movement that develops around this time, same time called Spiritism, uh, with people believing that they could uh, connect with the dead, uh, that the dead could provide messages uh, to the living. Somewhat similar uh, taking uh, place here. Uh, people believing uh, that they were experiencing spirit possession, uh, sometimes even um, uh, Native American spirits uh, taking over some believers, but believers being used as instruments. Um, sometimes people claimed uh, spirit, uh, spiritual audiences with Mother Anne. Uh, Mother Anne, of course, uh, died the late, later part of the 18th century, so by this time, uh, of course, she has uh, passed away. Uh, and these were very uh, loud times. People would, uh, Shakers would engage in what they called these mountain feasts, uh, where they gathered around these invisible spiritual uh, fountains. Uh, they would sing, dance, uh, claimed they ate manna as part of these feasts, uh, got drunk with heavenly wine, uh, and communed with uh, all these different spirits of different ethnicities, like I mentioned, Native American spirits, uh, African uh, spirits, uh, and uh, people from various time periods. This really alarmed a lot of older Shakers. Uh, you know, uh, they, they didn't see this as a um, major part of who they were, uh, so now this being added was, was quite uh, confusing, disturbing. Uh, but it does recognize some of the power dynamics that were taking place. A lot of the uh, spirits often spoke through children, uh, women, girls. Uh, so some of these communities that might have had uh, less power in other places, in other denominations, uh, found themselves, um, you know, kind of um, the opportunity here to, to have a voice. Uh, eventually, some of the Shaker leaders were able to exert control. They tried throughout the period, but eventually, you know, were able to uh, kind of uh, tamp this down and it uh, kind of uh, disappeared uh, eventually. Now, uh, as you might um, think, uh, you know, surprisingly, uh, the uh, uh, Shakers uh, haven't really continued as a group, right? It makes sense. You know, you have the lack of propagation. Uh, between 1821 and 1850, uh, it's estimated that 71% of girls and 87% of boys left at adulthood. Uh, so they did not stay with the movement uh, after they got old enough to leave. Um, and today, there are only two shakers left. Uh, in a community in Sabbath Day Lake, Maine. Um, it's, a, it's kind of a historical site, so it is a, um, a Shaker farm. Um, but, um, you know, there still are uh, two uh, Shakers left, um, but largely the movement has uh, disappeared. And there, there's not, there's, there's historical interest there, uh, but not, um, not any sort of um, interest in, in converting. That doesn't mean that the Shakers haven't had uh, some impact. Uh, there is a style of furniture known as Shaker furniture that comes from uh, the group, and so there are some people uh, that, that are really interested in Shaker furniture. Uh, they were the ones that uh, pioneered a variety of invention, including packaged spices, capsule pills. Uh, they created a horsepower washing machine. Uh, so in many respects, they, their influence was greater than the actual numbers uh, of people. So that's uh, one group uh, that developed uh, during this time known as the Shakers. Another group that developed around the same time 
uh, is a group known as the, the Oneida community. Um, the Oneida community was started by a man named uh, John Humphrey Noyes. Uh, he was a abolitionist, uh, was originally from uh, Putney, Ver Vermont, but moved to Oneida, New York, so upstate New York. Uh, essentially, he kind of, um, he kind of, one of his major uh, claims was that the Second Coming had uh, occurred in 70 uh, CE uh, or 70 AD, uh, depending on which you use. Uh, claimed basically that he was perfect and without sin. Now, he'd been a, a graduate of Dartmouth College, um, had been converted by uh, the revivals of uh, Charles Finney, studied at uh, Yale Divinity School uh, for a while, uh, but eventually kind of becomes convinced of, you know, kind of these utopian communities like uh, the Shakers did. A distinctive of the Oneida community uh, was the practice of complex marriage, which essentially said uh, everyone in the community was married to everyone else. Right? Um, so, you know, there, there was this idea of, um, you know, again, complex marriage where ma traditional marriage bonds were ignored. But only certain people were allowed to reproduce, right? So only certain people were allowed to have children. Uh, and this became known as scientific propagation, right? The idea of, uh, you know, only certain people within the community uh, would be allowed to uh, have children. Uh, they practiced the form of socialism uh, as well, communal property. Um, they, uh, uh, so, you know, again, distinct uh, from the Shakers, but essentially very similar ideas in the sense of you know the kind of these these new uh, notions of sexuality marriage uh, children uh, eventually the uh, company broke uh, the community broke up one lasting effect though of that um, has been uh, the Oneida silverware you may have seen this um, in a store uh, someplace but uh, you know the, the community one of the things they produced was silverware uh, but they had kind of a common stock company it's eventually been sold right? so there's not really the same kind of uh, you know, financial connection today uh, between an Ida silverware and this community um, but it is one of the kind of odd uh, ways in which there is this uh, impact from this religious group somewhat Christian uh, that we even still see today, even though they had uh, largely died off. We turn from these uh, two uh, smaller, uh, less impactful uh, communities uh, to, to talk about some communities that have had um, some greater impact in them, um, and, and greater impact, and greater followings uh, within the uh, the United States. Uh, one of those groups is the Millerites. Uh, now, as you can kind of see from this picture, uh, a lot of the focus of the Millerites was on the Second Coming. Uh, that is one thing that kind of uh, is is a, a piece that goes through all of these groups we're looking at. Is this um, interest in the Second Coming? Uh, sometimes belief that it's already taken place. Uh, some saying, well, it's going to take place soon. Uh, so you have, um, you know, a lot of a lot of connections here to the, the second coming and a lot of interest kind of in the end of the world, uh, essentially here with, uh, you know, these groups in the 19th century. And there was a lot of fascination with the end of the world. Uh, even the uh, Mormons, uh, even um, more traditional forms of Christianity, uh, you know, many uh, many people will be drawn to the Millerites uh, from this. And Miller himself, uh, you know, kind of starts off in a uh, traditional um, a traditional group. Um, Miller um, had kind of in his early adulthood was was a deist, 
joined uh, or fought in uh, the War of 1812, uh, largely an uneducated farmer. Um, and after the war, during the war, uh, you know, he kind of uh, becomes interested uh, in, in Christianity, he joins a uh, Calvinistic Baptist church uh, eventually, and he he's really wanting to learn. So he basically teaches himself, uh, doesn't go to a seminary or other type of religious educational institution, and so he starts studying the Bible. He's particularly interested in what are called apocalyptic texts in the Bible. Uh, this would be uh, Revelation is the major one, parts of Daniel, uh, parts of Ezekiel, uh, parts of Zechariah, but Daniel and Revelation are kind of the two that he's most interested in. And essentially Miller believes that both Daniel and Revelation uh, had a, uh, a message that ordinary people could understand. And so he becomes interested in trying to communicate that message. And he also comes to believe that within that message is the time period of Christ's return. And so he comes to the belief around 1818 that he's discovered when Christ is going to return. But even though by this point he's, he's preaching, or shortly after he becomes, uh, he becomes a preacher, uh, in the early 1830s he's, he becomes a preacher, and he's not really emphasizing uh, the, the date. Um, you know, he, he doesn't make that a central point. He's, he's preaching in general, but he's come to this idea that, that in 1843, Jesus is going to return. Sometime between 1843 and 1844. How did he get to that date? Well, he reads this passage in Daniel that says, um, there will be 2,300 days, and then the sanctuary will be cleansed. Now, he understood the sanctuary here to refer to earth. So he believes that this cleansing of earth must be the second coming. And he also knows that there are passages that talk about days where in, in the prophets, where days doesn't mean days, days means years. And he specifically is led to that through um, Daniel chapter 9 and the prophecy of the 70 weeks. And in this passage, it talks about, you know, the, the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Uh, certain uh, interpretations focus on uh, that it's, it's pointing to the Messiah and the arrival of the Messiah. And he knows, okay, well, the Messiah is Jesus. And uh, so this is talking about Jesus. But in this case, weeks can't be weeks because there was more than 70 weeks between Daniel chapter 9 and the arrival of Jesus. So he looks at the, the prophecy here and says, okay, they must be years. and that there were going to be 483 years between the rebuilding of the temple, the rebuilding of Jerusalem, and the arrival of Jesus. So taking 457 BCE, or BC, as his starting point, and the passage that said there would be 69 weeks between um, you know, this, uh, this, this time period, um, you know, he's, he's convinced that the math adds up properly, but between the rebuilding of the temple in 457 uh, BCE and the Messiah uh, were 483 years, or the 69 weeks that the passage talks about. So, if we take 2300, subtract 
457, right, because it's B.C. and A.D., um, that gets you to 1843 as the time uh, that, uh, you know, that the uh, that Jesus is going to be returned. Now, because there is no year zero, it could be 1843, it could be 1844. Um, and so uh, he goes, he's sometime between March 21st, 1843, and March 21st, 1844. Um, now, he uses March 21st because it was uh, the start of the Jewish New Year in the Levitical calendar, the way that most Jews uh, followed it uh, at that time and later is that is more towards like September. Um, so you know, in the in the, the calendar of Leviticus, uh, you know, this is um, this is largely how he's he's going here, right? And so sometime between uh, March twenty first, eighteen forty three, March twenty first, eighteen forty four, the uh, the Jesus is going to return. So, he begins promoting this. A uh, man named Joshua Hines uh, helps him write a book, uh, promote him, uh, helps him create a journal. Right? He's somebody that's been convinced by this. Right? William starts promoting it. Hines really kind of takes it, promotes him, uh, promotes his, his work, helps him create a journal. So, uh, he starts... Uh, promoting his views um, spreads to Ohio, Washington, um, you know, Washington, D.C., right? It's still a smaller part of the country. Uh, a variety of places. All about this, you know, the second coming, uh, sometime between March 21st, uh, 1843, and March 21st, 1844. It's getting to the point where the group is almost becoming a separate denomination. In many cases, a, a lot of people were following his teaching, believing his teachings, but not leaving their churches. They were still Baptists, they were still Presbyterians, they just believed that William Miller was right about the dating. You know, they were convinced by his uh, writing. Well, it probably comes as no shock to you that March 21st, 1844 came and went, and Jesus didn't return. Um... And a couple months after that, May, and actually May of 1844, Miller, can, you know, he's kind of like, well, I, I must be, must have been wrong. Um, you know, I, I, I must have uh, made a miscalculation, didn't understand something, et cetera, et cetera. Instead of the group disbanding, though, uh, although they do get smaller, right, you know, when, when a date like this passes, it, you know, it's... It's impossible for a group not to get smaller. But there are some people who believe, no, he, he's close, but he, he just has uh, the wrong time. The cleansing of the, sec the sanctuary in the Bible uh, took place on the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. Now, there was a group uh, that... Um, of Jews that celebrated uh, Yom Kippur on October 22nd that year. Not all Jews did, but some Jews did. And so there is a group of Miller's followers who believe uh, that he had gotten most of the math right, but had missed this part. And so they start convincing people, and eventually Miller himself, that October 22nd, 1844 uh, is the day that Jesus is going to return. And so, a lot of the people, not all of the people, but a lot of the people, Miller's followers, are convinced. And it's even said that some people uh, on that day, I mean, many of them closed their shops, sold their businesses, um, you know, and all in anticipation for the second coming. And there's uh, even tales of people like donning white uh, white robes uh, in expectation of Jesus' return. And again, uh, it probably comes no surprise, um, Jesus didn't return in October of 1844. Um, the aftermath of that has been called the uh, 
uh, the great disappointment in that a lot of people uh, kind of went away from this. Uh, Miller stops, uh, you know, talking about it. Um, you know, he's he's still convinced that Jesus is going to return soon. And for the last five years of his life, he's convinced that Jesus is going to re return soon. But there's no effort to try and come up with a new date. Right? He kind of abandons that idea. Now, in the aftermath of this, some people kind of deny it or denounce it, right? You know, I was fooled, you know, um, and, and walk away from it. Uh, there are some people that actually end up going to the shakers uh, from this, um, but there are others that, that hold on to it and believe that Miller was right about the date, but that he was wrong about what happened. And so he was wrong that Daniel 8, 14 referred to the second appearing of Christ. Instead, the sanctuary that was cleansed um, was, was more, of a, more, more of a heavenly sanctuary. That Jesus had been pleading for forgiveness before God... Um, up until this point in the 1840s, but was now blotting out sin in the heavenly holy of holies. Right? So instead of abandoning Miller's ideas, Miller's teaching, they reinterpret it to refer to something different. To this, um, this group adds a Sabbatarianism which essentially is worship on the seventh day. Now, of course, Jews had been worshiping on Saturday uh, for uh, a long uh, time. Um, and uh, there were some groups, Seventh-day Baptists, for example, who believed that the Sabbath day or, or Saturday was the day to worship. And so that interpretation of the sanctuary doctrine was joined with this Seventh-day worship as well as a belief of um, soul sleep, right? That souls are not taken uh, somewhere else, but they, they sleep within the body and the ground, right? For this corporealism, focusing on the body. And so it's not about the immortality of the soul, it's, the, uh, it's about the resurrected body. Um, and so the focus is much more on the soul staying with the body. So the sanctuary doctrine, uh, Sabbatarianism, corporealism, a belief in modern-day prophecy, um, particularly one of the individuals who is uh, important in this development is a woman named Ellen White. Uh, and so there is a belief that she, is, she begins to receive visions and new prophetic messages. And so... Joseph Bates, James White, and his and uh, his wife Ellen G. White, Ellen G. H. White, take this Millerite Adventism with the Sabbatarianism, the Sanctuary Doctrine, um, combine them all together into what is now known as Seventh Day Adventists. And so the Millerite movement announced the judgment of Earth, but the Seventh Day Adventists were kind of um, moving on to you know this this greater attention. Not only did they believe uh, in the importance of uh, the seventh day, they also believed that Sunday worship, worship on the first day, uh, was actually the mark of the beast. Uh, that Sunday worship was the creation of Catholics. Now. Part of this is a belief that the beast of Revelation 13 referred to the Pope and Roman Catholicism. So 
Sunday worship was the mark of the beast. And a couple of years ago, you could still see signs, billboards. Uh, you might not see them anymore. I don't know if any are still up, but on some major highways uh, here in the South, you could see billboards that said the mark of the beach, the Sunday worship, call us at such and such, such. Right. So, there, you know, it was still a, a pretty prevalent uh, doctrine um, that, you know, this was it, it's not just less worship on Saturday. It's to worship on Sunday is to follow uh, Roman Catholicism, to follow the Mark of the Beast, to follow the Antichrist, uh, all of which are these kind of apocalyptic uh, ideas. Now, historically, there's some problems with that. Uh, you know, there's there's quite a bit of evidence that uh, Christians were mar uh, worshiping on the first day of the week long before Catholicism was really Catholicism. Uh, but, you know, so there's historically some problems uh, with that. As I mentioned before, there was a lot of emphasis on uh, Ellen's visions. Um, they were They kind of served as a spiritual, supernatural verification of these doctrines. So one of the visions she has uh, is of the Ten Commandments in heaven uh, with the Fourth Commandment, which is the Sabbath day, kind of circled or highlighted. Um, you know, so that uh, um, that's a just justification for right this the Sabbatarianism. Another important distinction of um, the um, the Seventh Day Adventists was their uh, interest in health and hygiene, dietary restrictions, uh, you know, the re rejection of alcohol, uh, rejection of smoking, following kind of the the dietary laws of Leviticus. There was also a lot of interest in health in general, uh, so they create the Western Health Reform Institute in Battle Creek, Michigan, um, which uh, you know attracted uh, many people. Um, you know they uh, they went there. Um, they're they're interested in health, but they're kind of poorly trained, um, including. Uh, one of the heads of the institute um, kind of is interested in creating a breakfast food to uh, help, you know, avoid some of the sausage and bacon, which would have been rejected by the dietary laws. And so he cooked grains into these dry flakes or corn flakes. Uh, and so this doctor, John Harvey Kellogg, creates this cereal that could be eaten at breakfast. His brother, Will, is the one uh, who kind of takes it and runs with it, right? He's the one that kind of creates the Kellogg's uh, company, so to speak. Uh, as And so did uh, another one of Kellogg's patients, a man named C.W. Post, right? So you have Kellogg's and Post. Uh, coming out of some of these things with Seventh-day Adventists. To the best of my knowledge, there isn't a connection today, but much like the Shakers and Shaker Furniture, uh, some of their inventions, the Oneida Silverware, uh, you know, here we have this kind of religious group which produces something which eventually is still, uh, you know, kind of uh, a part of uh, our society. Another distinctive belief uh, that we also see in some other groups um, is the uh, the idea of con uh, conditional immortality. Um, that essentially, uh, when people die, they are in unconscious. Uh, they don't have immortality, so there's not the idea of an immortal soul. Um, and that uh, when God raises them, they are given immortality if they were good if they are going to to heaven uh, the unrighteous will be raised uh, but they will not be um, made immortal instead they will be punished and annihilated so they'll cease to exist um, so there isn't uh, the same kind of notion of uh, 
of immortality, eternal punishment. Uh, instead, it's a uh, part of the punishment is um, you know the ceasing to uh, exist. There are, there were uh, the latest numbers I had was between uh, fourteen and fifteen million Seventh Day uh, Adventists worldwide. Usually, uh, a large it's pointed out that a large majority of them are outside the United States, uh, sometimes even as high as 90% of Seventh-day Adventists are outside the United States. So even though it's, it develops as a uh, f form of Christianity in the United States, um, it's, uh, it's actually become more popular uh, outside the United States. And that's true uh, with Mormonism, it's about half and half. Um, and But it's also true for uh, another one of the groups we'll be exploring, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, there, too, uh, a large part of uh, the group is outside uh, the United States. But they also are one of these groups that develops in the, the 19th century um, and, uh, you know, really um, is focused on, um, you know, the, the, the second coming of Christ. The Jehovah's Witnesses, um, we could say, technically started with uh, Charles Taze Russell. The group was not known as Jehovah's Witnesses during his lifetime, um, but he's the one that kind of starts the group that serves as the foundation for Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, Russell was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania uh, in 1852. Uh, to a relatively uh, wealthy family. Um, he grew up Presbyterian, um, but with the Adventists and some others who were very interested in these kind of expectations of uh, a millennial return of Christ, a millennial reign, he decides to leave Presbyterian, Presbyterianism. And much like William Miller, uh, he is interested in biblical prophecy. He spends a lot of time uh, and energy uh, studying uh, the book of Revelation, other uh, biblical uh, prophetic literature, and is you know, going through all sorts of sources because he's just really interested in it and wants to understand it. And not only is he interested in understanding it himself, he wants to share that with other people as well. So he begins to share his uh, ideas with others. He begins to age, engage other people uh, in his study of biblical prophecy. Uh, and these Bible study circles start developing. They refer to themselves as Bible students. And really, uh, Russell doesn't seem to have had an interest in creating a new denomination. You know, his interest is just, you know, people getting together to study. Now, after starting these Bible study circles, he eventually will begin writing his uh, ideas down, begins uh, writing books and tracts uh, about his distinctly, distinct belief, uh, becomes very prolific uh, in writing them uh, large uh, volumes of writing uh, that he is uh, putting into all of this. So what are some of the things that he is teaching, uh, specifically with, with respect to biblical prophecy? Well, like William Miller, Russell believed that he had discovered within the text of the Bible the date of Jesus' return. Now, you know, Christians throughout history have believed that Jesus is going to return, and frequently they've talked about it being soon, right? Jesus is going to return soon. Um, what that soon means is, of course, differed, and of course, here we sit, you know, in the year 2021 when I'm when I'm uh, recording this, uh, you know, and, and Jesus' return has not happened yet. 
uh, but a lot of Christians would expect him to return soon. Russell, like many people that uh, call themselves Christians, um, believed he would uh, establish an earthly kingdom. Uh, there are other, excuse me, other people who uh, do not believe that that kingdom uh, is going to be an earthly kingdom. But um, Russell believed that uh, Jesus was going to reign as king on earth. Now, not everybody that believes uh, in the soon return of Jesus or uh, is very just very interested in the end times and the return of Jesus goes so far as to give a date to it. But uh, Russell did. Uh, in the 1870s, uh, he started promoting the belief uh, that Jesus had uh, spiritually returned to earth in 1874 and would complete his return in 1878 with the beginning of a millennial age. This, uh, the millennium, a thousand years, uh, coming from Revelation chapter 20, uh, was supposed to be a period of, of great peace and prosperity. And so the expectation was the millennial kingdom would start in 1878. Uh, when Jesus didn't return in 1878, um, Russell uh, kind of uh, did some more study, attempted to explain what happened, and uh, later predicted that Jesus would, re would return in 1914. Um, he would make additional uh, changes. Others within the movement uh, would um, also speculate about Jesus' return uh, as late as 1975, had been offered at one point. I believe that has pretty well um, declined, that there, it is not common around, among current Jehovah's Witnesses to very publicly uh, give a uh, date. Another doctrine that uh, Russell promoted uh, was the idea that the church, from the time of Jesus to the end of time, would be made up of only 144,000 members. Now this too comes from Revelation chapters, uh, the, the book of Revelation, this time chapter 7. And by 1881, uh, he had essentially argued that the number was complete, but it was possible that living members of this group uh, could, could fall away from the truth, allowing for others to be included in that number. Now, uh, this being part of the 144,000 was a special honor that not many people could attain. Um, Russell uh, noted that uh, even uh, people like Moses and Elijah, uh, who were ancient people, held in very high honor, uh, you know, people that we respect uh, as Christians, uh, you know, before people that were before Christ, even some of those didn't attain this a group of 144,000, which were called the elect class or the little flock, uh, sometimes the bridal class. Uh, these people would join Jesus. They would be in the heavens. Um, others are going to live on earth, they claimed. And so there's kind of two classes of members within this group. Uh, and even so today, there's the 144,000. And then there's this other group called the Great Company. Um, in Revelation chapter 7, uh, there, that's where that distinction comes from. The first part talks about the 144,000, and then John sees a, a large company, a great company that he cannot number. So the idea was this great company is going to live on a reconstructed earth while the 144,000 would be in heaven. Uh, additionally, the 144,000, uh, only people who were a part of the 144,000 uh, were to partake of the yearly communion, which we'll talk about uh, in a little bit. Russell claimed that this group, both the 144,000, um, as well as to some extent um, the Bible students, uh, were kind of a restored Israel. It's not surprising in some ways that you see this notion of a restored Israel in these kind of apocalyptic movements that are convinced of the, the nearness of the end times. 
in some days, in some ways, the Seventh Day Adventists uh, are doing this, right? They're they're following the Sabbath, they're following the dietary laws of Le Leviticus. So there's the connection to Israel. Um, you know, there's the Rus Russell claiming that the Bible students are kind of a restored Israel. Um, and so there's this notion of this continuity of the with the Israelites, and even you know, in the New Testament, of course. Uh, the followers of Jesus are connected with Israel uh, and spiritual Israel, true Israel. Um, and so many people, of course, have that have this idea. This is true even more among more traditional forms of Christianity um, that uh, that when Jesus returns, he's going to set up his earthly kingdom in Israel with Jerusalem as the capital. And of course, when Israel was created as a new nation state in 1948, that really set off a lot of speculation, um, you know, by people that this was the end times. Uh, so they, the 144,000 would become Jews, right, uh, under this this idea, although not necessarily be Jewish, right? It's not that the 144,000 was only from Jewish people; it's they would become Jews, even though they might have been. Gentiles or non-Jews before this, um, and so even here, you know, Russell dies thirty years before there's a nation a nation of Israel like there is uh, today, um, and so in the years prior to World War One, Russell believed that the Jews would return to the Middle East, uh, set up uh, a nation. Uh, there were other people that believed this as well that weren't necessarily part of his group. Uh, but he believes that this is that this would happen to begin the millennium, uh, and so for a lot of Zionist Jews, Jews that were wanting this to happen, were working to establish uh, a nation of Israel. Russell, the Bible students, often found uh, common cause uh, with these people pushing for uh, a renewed homeland during Russell's lifetime. There was not much effort at institutionalizing this group, of, of, of making it into a denomination. Uh, that's more post-Russell's life. But there were a couple of things that demonstrate kind of some of the organizational aspects of it that, um, that have you know, kind of come out of it and served as a foundation for uh, this development. One of those was a journal uh, formed by um, Russell uh, called the Zion's Watchtower and Herald of Christ's Presence. Um, today, it's just known as the Watchtower. Uh, and uh, if Jehovah's Witnesses come to your door and uh, you know they, you allow them to leave some literature with you, uh, this is the the current form of this is usually uh, one of the uh, one of the pieces that they will leave uh, with you. So it's been, it's been around for uh, a long time. So the start of this journal uh, as a means to uh, promote Russell's teaching, uh, eventually the, the teachings of uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, there was also uh, kind of incorporation of uh, the publishing, right, that, that Russell was doing, as we mentioned, very prolific, and so he creates uh, the Zion's Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Uh, so it's kind of an incorporation of his pub publishing uh, efforts. Later, the word Zion was dropped. Uh, it's the official publishing arm of the Jehovah's Witnesses. It was started, and it was really, in a sense, the only official organization in the group. Right? There, there's not a denominational board or a denominational hierarchy you might see in other denominations uh, or other forms of Christianity, but you know you have this uh, publishing arm. Um, it started in Philadelphia. Russell moved it to Brooklyn. Uh, it's moved a little bit uh, in Brooklyn, but uh, I think they. The, this is an older uh, picture, I believe, of the headquarters. I believe they have a new headquarters, but I, I'm not positive uh, about that. Uh, but the move to Brooklyn took place in 1900. Um, re responsible for producing the, the Watchtower, um, other publishing efforts, including 
uh, Russell's six volume work, uh, Studies in the Scriptures, uh, which uh, kind of outlines uh, you know, uh, his distinctive doctrines. Another change that happens that makes this more of an institutionalized movement is the transition that takes place from these Bible study circles into actual, um, you know, churches or congregations. Um, as I mentioned, he was not interested in starting a new denomination, and each of the Bible study circles was technically autonomous. Um, it was not directly uh, controlled by Russell, right? They didn't report to him per se, but Often they were guided by his materials uh, produced by the Bible and Tract Society. But each circle had its own leadership. Yeah, yes, it tended to be people that were loyal to Russell uh, or disciples of Russell. Um, but it wasn't, uh, you know, the same kind of thing like you, you would think even with Methodism to some extent. Uh, which is pretty, uh, you know, pretty well was autonomous uh, as it was started. Um, you know, there was no creed that technically bound everybody together, and the Bible and Tract Society was really the only organization. But eventually, you know, these circles would become congregations and part of really a larger denominational type of body. And the, one of the key things for that transition was the death of Russell. <clears throat> um, his death led to a leadership crisis. as well as a crisis for survival. Will this group continue? Just like with the, the death of Joseph Smith, with the Mormons, right? Will this movement continue? Um, Russell died in 1916, uh, which was two years after the predicted return of Christ. Remember his last, uh, you know, was 1914. Um, and so when that happened, many students, maybe bottle students, defected. Um, there was a, you know, they kind of gave up. For those that remained, there was a struggle for power that did lead to uh, some groups that split off. Uh, but the major group stayed with a Missouri lawyer named Joseph Rutherford, uh, who was elected as president of the Publishing, Publishing Society. Now, he was a lawyer uh, from Missouri, but he was often referred to as judge. And so judge Rutherford, um, and he's the one that really um, transformed the Bible student movement into the Jehovah's Witnesses. He continued this interest in kind of an apocalyptic outlook uh, focused on the return of Christ, and he began to refer to the group as the New World Society. And kind of or his major focus uh, in those times was organizing and making the evangelistic efforts more systematic. And so kind of, you know, as people were interested in sharing their ideas with other people, um, you know, he, uh, uh, he kind of made that more systematic with uh, requirements for reporting, how much time was spent uh, evangelizing and, and having Bible studies and, and other things like that. And he also uh, pushed for efforts to evangelize other countries, send missionaries to other countries. Um, he also launched a, another uh, journal uh, in addition to the Watchtower. Uh, it was originally called uh, the Golden Age, uh, but it was, uh, it's now called Awake. Uh, that's the other piece of literature that uh, witnesses will tend to leave uh, with you uh, when they visit uh, the Watchtower and Awake, the current form. And Awake tended to emphasize in those early years the necessity of home evangelism, uh, that each student uh, should be evangelistic. He continued, of course, to promote the ideas of the soon return of Christ, uh, writing a book using the slogan, uh, Millions Now Living Will Never Die, which was published in the 1920s. Um, and, you know, the belief, the continued belief of Jesus' soon return, the millennial kingdom is imminent, um, and so there was the need for uh, getting that message out. Those witnesses, eventually witnesses, 
uh, who um, promoted the message, who evangelized door to door, were called publishers. They were publishing the message. Um, and so not only is there this increased emphasis on publishing, um, there's also uh, Rutherford created a monitoring system um, with a uh, quota of the number of hours uh, that you spend evangelizing uh, and expectations that there would be weekly reports. Um, and so this was another one of those times where uh, you know people split off. Uh, one group becoming the Dawn Bible Students Association, still committed to Russell's teaching, um, but you know n not following Rutherford and his direction into what became the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, Rutherford brought about some other changes as well. Uh, one of those uh, was the uh, use of small buildings um, for these congregations. Uh, you know, he he does make more of an effort to uh, centralize his authority. Uh, so while the Bible study circles were largely independent, uh, you know, these become more congregations. Um, under his headship. And the small buildings of these uh, congregations were called Kingdom Halls. He kind of takes the effort to abolish the uh, local leadership and kind of set up more of like a regional hierarchy of overseers that do kind of reports to the central uh, part of the Bible and Tract Society. Uh, we'll talk more about uh, Kingdom Halls uh, here in a little bit, but just to note that you know here's this more organizational uh, process taking place. Um, additionally, there are some other changes that take place, especially with respect to this idea of, okay, how do we explain um, the fact that the dates that had been promoted were wrong? Now, Russell um, had adopted some rather ingenious explanations for what had happened in 1874 and 1878 and the judgment that's supposed to happen. Um, and before his death, he'd even attempted to try and explain the apparent inactivity in 1914. Now, eventually, the events of 1874, 1878 gradually disappeared from the teaching and the memory of witnesses, but 1914 stayed on. Uh, the explanation was that Jesus had invisibly finished his judgment of the world and was ruling with uh, the 144,000 um, that were resurrected dead, right? Not all of the 144,000 were dead, um, but Jesus was ruling in his heavenly kingdom, and so he had invisibly uh, had his coming, and uh, so Jesus was, something did happen in 1914, and that World War I especially was kind of a reflection of Jesus' judgment uh, and vengeance uh, on sinful humanity. So, you know, this is another effort to try and, you know, kind of give some justification to Russell's teachings while also you know, trying to explain why things didn't take place the way people and even Russell himself kind of claimed they were supposed to. Another important change uh, is the name of the group. In 1931, uh, Rutherford announced that the group would be known as Jehovah's Witnesses. And so the Bible student name was gone in place of a name that was a meant to be a marker of distinctive witness teaching. Witnesses will insist that the God they follow is a specific God named Jehovah. Right? They don't just follow God. God has a personal name, and his name is Jehovah. Now, Jehovah as God's name, or the claim that God's name was Jehovah, has been around um, for a while. Uh, if you look at the American Standard Version of the Bible from 1901, uh, several times in the text you'll see the name Jehovah. Uh, most scholars, biblical scholars, uh, believe that 
this is a misunderstanding of the Hebrew word that, that was used for God's personal name. So, for example, in Exodus 3, uh, 3, when God appears to Moses in the burning bush and gives him his name, um, people thought it was, it was meant to be understood as Jehovah. Um, more, more recently, scholars believe it's probably Yahweh, rather than, or Yahweh, rather than Jehovah. Um, but, you know, in the early 20th century, it was still believed that Jehovah was the appropriate name. And so Jehovah's Witnesses uh, have held on to that. Now, because of some of their beliefs uh, and some of their ideas, uh, Witnesses have faced uh, persecution, uh, not only in the United States, but in, throughout the world. Um, in the face of World War I, for example, uh, many Bible students refu refused to serve in the military uh, and adopted kind of a pacifistic-like stance. Now, witnesses believe they will serve in Jehovah's army, so they are not technically pacifists. But they do believe that they shouldn't pledge their allegiance or commit their allegiance to any nation on earth. Um, and that included the United States. And so mobs attacked them, several were jailed, uh, students that were distributing anti-war literature, um, you know, that grew, drew even more attention, uh, negative attention. Um, there was a, a governmental act known as the Sedition Act of uh, 1918, and uh, eight directors, including Rutherford, were arrested under that. Uh, they eventually won a, a retrial uh, on appeal. Uh, the government dropped the charges, but nearly all of the publishing equipment in Brooklyn had been destroyed uh, because, of, uh, because of this. Witnesses also faced um, a variety of court cases, a variety of persecution over the refusal to salute the flag which also comes from this idea of not giving your allegiance to any uh, government. Um, over 40 cases concerning um, Jehovah's Witnesses have appeared before the Supreme Court. The two most famous uh, involved uh, children, school children, who refused to f salute the flag. Now, the Witnesses originally lost a ruling in 1940 uh, but then won a different case in 1943 uh, that allowed Jehovah's Witnesses to, uh, to refuse to salute the flag and not require them to salute the flag. Uh, there have been other cases involving the right to evangelize door to door, the right to distribute literature in, in public places, uh, the question of blood transfusion, even the re refusal to, to or the withholding of life-saving transfusions. Um, I saw part of a documentary one time that made the claim, which might be, you know, to some extent accurate, um, that these cases involving the witnesses have had such uh, an impact on religious freedom in the United States and expanding religious freedom in the United States. Um, certainly that was not the intention. I don't think that was the intention of any of the witnesses that were involved in these cases. They weren't looking to expand religious freedoms for all. Uh, they were probably more interested in having their own religious freedoms, but it has expanded religious freedom uh, for all as a consequence. Um, a final example of persecution that uh, witnesses have faced uh, was in Nazi Germany. Certainly Jews were the primary target of the Holocaust. Um, that much of the efforts uh, was in uh, focus on Jews, but other groups um, were, were targeted as, as well. Homosexuals, people that were referred to as gypsies, but now more commonly referred to as Roma, uh, gypsy being a little bit um, uh, considered derogatory. Uh, so uh, homosexuals, Roma, uh, and witnesses. Uh, were imprisoned in concentration camps and uh, many of them ended up being executed as well. So facing a lot of persecution uh, because of their distinctive belief, people that objected to the war, for example, and didn't want to serve uh, in, uh, you know, uh, especially the Nazi Germany uh, army. 
We'll finish up with witnesses by talking about uh, some distinctive beliefs and practices of uh, the witnesses. One is uh, one that probably a lot of people know about is the rejection of blood transfusion. Um, in both the Old Testament uh, and the New Testament, uh, there are re um, restrictions given on the eating of blood um, in the Old Testament laws as well as in the New Testament. And so the doctrine developed that, and the belief was that taking of blood into the body in any way is forbidden by these commandments. Right? And so the eating of blood didn't just mean physically eating blood, it meant bringing blood into your body through any means including blood transfusions, even if it's their own blood. So, for example, uh, you know, if you're going to have this huge surgery coming up, some surgeons and some hospitals and some people will actually kind of donate their own blood to be used as the transfusions over, you know, a couple months or whatever in preparation for the surgery. Witnesses would not even do that, uh, believing that it's against that command. And so uh, many witnesses uh, will carry cards, like in a purse or a wallet, uh, somewhere else like that, that if they're in the, an accident and are not able to uh, communicate, uh, that there is an indication to uh, the medical personnel that this person is not to receive a transfusion. Now, uh, even life-saving transfusions, uh, you know, that they're, you know, they'll die without it. Uh, now, certainly there are some witnesses who have done transfusions, uh, received transfusions, uh, and that often leads to, you know, some tensions between themselves and the rest of their family that might be witnesses, themselves and the rest of the witnesses in their particular community. Um, it also, in some ways, has pushed some doctors and some uh you know, universities and things like that to explore, um, you know, bloodless surgery, right? Are there efforts that we can, you know, reduce the amount of blood um, using other types of products uh, that would that could be transfused, which would be acceptable, uh, you know? And so there's, there's all sorts of uh, medical advances that have been pursued uh, because of this. So again, you know, another uh, consequence of this, uh, certainly not anything that is being used on a wide scale yet, but potentially could in the future, you know, a variety of processes where there isn't as much of a need to transfuse people while they are undergoing um, significant surgery. Another distinctive um, belief of the witnesses is that um, is, is, is against the idea of the cross. Uh, witnesses believe that because of how much the cross, the traditional T, -T cross has been used in Christian architecture, jewelry, clothing, um, it's basically become an idol to people in, in the mind of witnesses. And certainly they believe that Jehovah wants them to abstain from idol worship. And so they don't use crosses in their architecture or wear crosses. But they even claim that Jesus really didn't die on a traditional T-shaped cross. Instead, uh, he be they believe that he was um, crucified on a single pole that they refer to as a torture stake, uh, as presented in the picture uh, here. It it's possible... I mean, this was one type of possible crucifixion. There are a variety. I mean, there were X-shaped crosses, T-shaped crosses, capital T-shaped crosses. Um, but, you know, it, it, it doesn't seem from the text that it was simply a, a pole, that it was something with a cross beam uh, that was used. Um, but what's interesting uh, beyond that is... Um, in the Jehovah's Witnesses translation, every time the word cross comes up, it is translated as torture stake instead of cross uh, in the Jehovah's Witnesses translation. Witnesses uh, reject 
the idea of the Trinity. Uh, they have a belief in a Unitarian concept of God. Uh, and so Jesus was a created being. Um, in, in some forms, he's often uh, connected with the archangel Michael. Uh, he was a being known as the Logos um, that became a human being. Right? So it, he wasn't born as a human. He was created, but you know, then became human. Um, and the Holy Spirit is not a person or being, but more of the power or energy of Jehovah. Uh, so, you know, there is, to, call, to call Jehovah's Witnesses Christians uh, is a, a complicated uh, endeavor, right? They don't really identify as, uh, in, as Christians. They, they are Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, but there are, of course, some very um, practices that are, are similar to uh, Christianity, and their scriptures include the Old Testament and the New Testament. But they are in a specific translation. Now, unlike Mormons that have their own scriptures in addition to the Bible, Jehovah's Witnesses have their own version of the Bible, which is called the New World Translation. Um, it is modified, uh, or it's different from other translations, in that it follows a lot of traditional uh, witness doctrine, uh, using Jehovah exclusively throughout the Old Testament, but even using Jehovah uh, to talk about God in the New Testament. Now, Jehovah would be based off of the Hebrew word for God's personal name. Um, so, if anything, it should only be a Old Testament word, but uh, witnesses in the New World Translation also use Jehovah in the New Testament. And, of course, using torture stake uh, instead of cross. Uh, as mentioned uh, previously, uh, witnesses meet in buildings known as Kingdom Halls. Uh, they are usually very simple in style, um, and they are, they are put up very quickly. So when a, a, you know, a Kingdom Hall is getting ready to be built, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a few different styles. Um, pre-planned and all that, so it um, uh, you know it, it it develops pretty quickly. Uh, usually, uh, you know, there's an auditorium, uh, a place to pick up literature. Uh, witnesses might meet uh, three times a week uh, in sessions uh, that are basically classroom type education, studying the material that they hand out. Um, evangelism is a very important part of. Uh, witnesses' lives, they're expected to put in a certain amount of time uh, going door to door uh, and other types of um, um, efforts to evangelize. Um, in 2011, uh, witnesses uh, reported 1.74 billion, a billion with a B, hours in publishing activity. Uh, in 2020, it was 1.6 billion hours. So it's gone down a little bit. Witnesses um, do observe um, a practice, uh, the practice of communion, but it's referred to as the Lord's Evening Meal. Uh, it is celebrated only once a year on the night of Passover. Now, of course, other Christian groups uh, observe it regularly. Uh, you know, in some traditions, like Catholics, uh, some other liturgical traditions, uh, traditions you could get it possibly even daily. Um, others uh, do it quarterly. Uh, it appears the early church does it weekly, and so there's some groups that, um, you know, including the Churches of Christ, which are which is Faulkner's background, uh, do it weekly. But witnesses believe that it's meant to be observed yearly uh, on the day that it was established, uh, connected with the night of Passover. Now. What's problematic is only members of the 144,000 can take the Lord's evening meal. All right, so you look at this picture and you see all these people, you know, uh, passing, uh, you know, a tray. Probably a majority of them are not actually taking it. Um, and while there are millions of people that gather for it, it appears like there's only in the thousands. Uh, for the number of people that actually take the Lord's Evening Meal or participate in the Lord's Evening Meal. 
there are um and in 2020 which is the last numbers i had for uh there were about 17.8 million people that per participated in uh, the lord's evening meal uh, that's down from uh, 2011 uh, when it was 19 million um, a lot of focus is less on that number than on the number of people actually involved in publishing activity right so you kind of get these different numbers and the numbers that uh, while witnesses are you know very interested in the numbers for the Lord's evening meal they're more interested in you know what's the number of publishers uh, in 2011 it was 7.53 million uh, in 2020 it was 8.4 million uh, but they logged uh, a fewer uh, hours in 2011 it was 1.74 billion uh, in 2020 uh, it was 1.6 billion about a quarter of publishers are in the United States so 1.2 million publishers in the United States out of 8.4 million uh, publishers worldwide but what's more difficult for witnesses is the low retention rate uh, a lot of uh, the kids when they grow up leave the witnesses and it's estimated that only about 37 percent and actually that number might be higher than what it is today uh, 37 percent stay with the group uh, that grew up in it uh, and so there's a lot more effort to try and get new people in because a lot of the kids uh, tend to leave when they reach adulthood so here you have these various groups uh, that develop in this 19th century providing new options uh, for being religious in the United States various ways of connecting with Christianity uh, all of them having some connection um, some more closely tied to Christianity than, than others but do represent just the religious freedom religious innovation uh, the charisma of religious leaders all of which are happening uh, here in this 19th century